Peace and hope, not fear. It's hard to grasp hold of in these times, and not only is it hard to grasp hold of, we have an enemy. The Bible says in John 10, 10, that the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. Jesus said, I have come that they may have life, that they may have it more abundantly. But we have a thief, the devil. And the thief tries to steal our peace. He tries to steal your joy. And he tries to steal your faith. He absolutely does. He tries to kill you with sickness, with accidents. Make no mistake, uh, some have euphemized that, and I have in the past, that he's just trying to uh, kill your testimony or kill something. No, he's trying to kill you, literally. And he tries to destroy you with fear and depression. And right now, he's doing the first and the last in a very big way. He's doing all three. There's a lot of people dying. I don't know if you, I, I said it at the beginning, down in Cincinnati last night, 17 to 18 different shootings. I can't even imagine that. Oh, just overnight, in one night, not even 24 hours, just one night. Several are probably going to die. They're in the hospital in intensive care. But uh, right now, the devil is working overtime. And he's stealing peace. Many in the family of God have had their peace stolen. Many in the family of God have had their joy taken away. Many of in the family of God have had their, their faith is just, and all it is is the mustard seed right now. Jesus said that's enough, but uh, sometimes it seems like the devil just tries to destroy every bit that we have. I'm going to read some, some examples out of the Bible and, and you'll catch on in just a minute. But let me read several. And I think you'll identify with some of these. In Psalm 137, verses 1 through 4, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it. For there those who carried us away captive asked of us a song. And those who plundered us requested mirth, saying, Sing one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the song, Lord's song in a foreign land? Doesn't it feel like we're in a foreign land right now? This is not the United States of America that I grew up in. This is not even the United States of America that I raised my son in. It's totally different from anything I could ever imagine. We are a Christian nation, no matter what everyone else says. Everything that founded our nation was uh, founded in God. It's in all our documents. And if you walk through Washington, D.C., you find scriptures written on all the, uh, all the main buildings, all the monuments. We are a Christian nation, and the devil's trying his very best to destroy that Christian nation and to destroy the church and shut down the church, and if possible, to destroy even the very elect. And there's too many that feel just like this. Let me explain, explain what was going on there in Babylon. Uh, Israel has been quarantined. They've been carried away. They're captive. But to put it into to what we can identify with, they're quarantined. They're quarantined in Babylon for a while. And it's because of the sins of their nation. Does this sound familiar to any of you? We are a Christian nation, but we've not. there's some sins in our history and in our past. Not everyone... In fact, not everyone that was in Israel. There were some that were still holding on to God, still believed in, in God, still tried to live for Him. There were three Hebrew children that wouldn't bow to the statue. They got thrown in the fire. You remember that story? And in the fire, a fourth one came along. And, and even the king said, oh, it looks like the Son of God. And they were there in the fire and went through the fire. And when they came out the other side, it said not even the smell of smoke was on their garments. They still had to go through the fire, but God went with them. Amen? Daniel didn't give in. Daniel, when he heard that they had put out a decree that you can't even pray unless you're praying to the king who they were considering a god, Daniel opened his windows three times a day and prayed toward Jerusalem. And he didn't care who heard it. There were others. Mordecai. Esther. But many of them just gave up. Many of them hung their harps on the weeping willows. How can we ever sing the songs of Zion again? They were just ready to quit. That's it. We're done. How can we ever sing the Lord's song in this strange territory? 
In 1 Kings 19, and I've been looking a lot at Ahab and, and Jezebel and Elijah lately. There's a lot of things going on in that story that are similar to what we're facing today. I really believe that Jezebel's spirit is in our land. That Jezebel's spirit tries to destroy anything of God, any move of God, comes against anybody that stands up for God. That's what happened with Elijah. Elijah, uh, or in 1 Kings 19, verses 1 through 9, and Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had executed all the prophets with a sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So let the gods do to me, uh, do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. Verse 3. This is Elijah. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant. Beersheba is the southern part of the land of Israel. King Ahab was ruling and where all this took place was in the northern part. He ran as far away as you can get from that storm. He ran from Mount Carmel all the way down to the southern part, the, the Negev, the desert. How many remember what Elijah had done? Keep this in mind. He had shown up on the scene from nowhere in uh, 1 Kings 17, came before Ahab because God sent him there and he made this statement. He said, Ahab, because of all that's going on, I'm paraphrasing. He said, God's judging this land right now and it's not going to rain until I say so. <laughs> and he left. And God hid him away in a couple of different places. And then finally, when it was time to come back, three and a half years later, God told Elijah it's time for rain. And so he came back, presented himself to Ahab again, said, okay, it's time. We're going to have a contest. Gather up all your false prophets, meet me on Mount Carmel, and we'll decide who God really is. And you all know the story. There were 850 false prophets, and Elijah let them go first. And they cried, and they cut themselves, and they did all they could. And uh, uh, nothing happened. And then Elijah had his turn. And so he, he put the sacrifice on the altar. He doused it with water. You remember that? Seven barrels of water over it. Soaked. And then he prayed a small prayer. And God answered by fire. Burnt up the sacrifice. All the water. All the dust. Everything. And so all the false prophets were executed. Elijah was left standing. He went to pray, bowed down seven times. And every time they prayed, he got up and said to his servant, go look. And seven times he looked. And on the seventh time, he said, there's a small cloud like a man's hand. Elijah said, that's it. It's going to rain. And he told, he told the king, he told Elijah, said, it's, it's getting ready to, uh, to rain. And, and you better get off the mountain before your chariot gets stuck. And then Elijah took off running and outran the chariot. Talk about a man of faith. Man of God prayed and it stopped raining, prayed again and it started raining again. James called him and said, said, he's a man like us, but he prayed in faith. Yeah, here come Jezebel and said, you're dead. <laughs> I'm coming after you and you're dead. Just like you did to my false prophets, you're dead. And Elijah took off running. Had all this faith and then all of a sudden it's gone and there was fear. And he took off running toward the, toward the south. And, and, and let's read the rest. Verse 4 says, and, But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under, under a broom tree. He left his servant and went a day's journey farther. He was all alone. He had isolated himself. He had isolated himself. So he had fear. Isolation. And it says he came and sat down under a broom tree and he prayed that he might die. Sounds like he's getting pretty depressed, doesn't it? He said, it's enough, Lord. Take my life, for I am no better than my father's. And as he lay, he slept under the broom tree. One translation said he collapsed under the broom tree. And in the next verse said, exhausted. And we're feeling like that. A lot of God's children. Fear. Isolation. We're being isolated from one another. 
exhaustion? How many have been feeling just worn out recently? Just exhausted from all of this. And then depression. Well, God's people don't get depressed. We've got the Spirit of God in us. No, we do. We get pressed down hard enough, it hits. I don't care who you are. Elijah was. Elijah that called down fire from heaven and withstood against all the false prophets. Elijah did. Goes on and says, suddenly an angel uh, touched him and said, Arise and eat. And he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. Aren't you glad that God still nourishes us even when we're going through stuff and even when we can't hardly have any faith, He still provides. David said, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, He prepares a table before me right in the presence of all my enemies. So he ate and drank, laid back down. He's exhausted. He's depressed. Verse 7, the angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him and he said, Arise and eat because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank. And he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. And there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? God fed him with some things that would strengthen him this time. And he came to where God was, the mountain of God, got up. And I've always read that verse like this. Some of you have heard me preach. I've always read that verse like this, uh, that, that God came up and there's Elijah. He said, what are you doing here, Elijah? God checked me for this morning. He said, sometimes, sometimes I still say it like that because there's those that know better. They know where God is. They, they prayed and they, but there's sometimes he comes along and says, what are you doing here? Softly and tenderly. God knows our nature. And He knows how to speak to every one of us. How we need to hear. Listen to Elijah's answer. Keep in mind, he's the man of God that prayed fire down from heaven. Here's his answer in verse 10. So he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. God, I'm all alone. I'm the only one. Anybody ever feel like that? I have. I've been through some stuff. Cindy and I together have been through some Stuff. Stuff that it, is, it almost broke me. Almost broke me. This was already in Elijah before he even listened to this in chapter 18, verse 22. He said, Then Elijah said to the people, I alone have left a prophet of God. So that was in him before they even did the sacrifice and the fire. And all. He was already feeling like I'm all alone. He was trying to have faith in God and, and the fire fell, but, but it, it caught up with him. And after it was all done and it, Jezebel is threatening him with death and then he's saying, I'm all alone. Just go ahead and take me home. Numbers chapter 11, verse 11. So Moses said to the Lord, Why have you afflicted your servant? Why have I not found favor in your sight that you have laid the burden of all this people on me? Verse 14 and 15. The burden is too heavy for me. If you treat me like this, please kill me here and now. This is Moses, the deliverer. An Old Testament type of Jesus Christ came before Pharaoh with plagues, with a staff that was, you remember that staff that turned into a serpent and then became a staff. It was now God's rod of power. And he stood in front of Pharaoh and said, let my people go. Him and Aaron with him. 
They've come out of Egypt with a high hand. They came to the Red Sea and Moses again stretched his staff out and the seas parted. They walked across on dry ground, sang a song of deliverance on the other side. There was water from a rock, manna from heaven. He's already been up to Mount Sinai, received the Ten Commandments. God downloaded him into, into Moses all the knowledge and wisdom he would need for this journey. How to build the tabernacle, what to do, how to do this. Every, God down face to face with God and God downloaded into him. The Lord was a pillar of fire by night guarding them. Pillar of cloud by day leading them, directing them. And now Moses is saying, I'm done. That's it. Get somebody else. And, and can you imagine saying this to God? If you're going to treat me like this, go ahead and kill me now. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's a dangerous thing to say to a God that can send lightning out of heaven. Huh? You see, you're not the only one. The devil tries to make, the think you, make you think like Elijah that you're all alone and you're on, the only one going through what you're going through. These powerful servants of God. Moses who saw God face to face on the mountain with a thick cloud that came down. Moses, who was called a friend of God. Moses, who went into the Holy of Holies. And his faith, God was there. And when he came out, his face was shining so bright that the Israel made him put a veil over his face. They couldn't even look at him. That Moses is standing here saying, well, God, if you're going to treat me like this, just go ahead and take me home. I can't take it anymore. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through nine, this is the Apostle Paul writing to one of the churches he planted, pioneered. One of the greatest evangelists alongside Jesus Christ that we've ever seen. And he writes, and lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan, to buffet me lest I should be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. Paul pleaded, God, I can't take this. Everywhere I go, that every, every time I plant a church, there it is. Every time I try to do anything, there it is. Verse 9, He said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly will I rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Paul said, I need you to take this away. I can't take it anymore. And God's answer was, my strength is sufficient. I'm not going to take it away, but I'm going to give you the strength and the power. You are not the only one to lose your peace, to lose your joy, to even have your faith squashed down that feels like there's nothing there. In fact, he began this letter in 2 Corinthians chapter, uh, chapter 1. He, Paul began this letter in verses 8 through 10. He said, For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength. Listen, Apostle Paul, so that we despaired even of life. This is going to kill me. That's what he's telling. He's writing to him. said, we were going through so much stuff. In fact, read. Read in this letter. All that the Apostle Paul faced. But then he, he went on. He said this. Yes, we had the sentence of death. Verse 9. We had the sins of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver, and in whom we trust that He will still deliver. He has delivered, past tense. He does deliver, present tense. And He will still deliver us in the future. He's still God. 
Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And anything He's ever done, He can still do. Anything He's ever done for anyone, He can do for you. And anything He's done anywhere, He can do right here. Psalm 42. We've used this as a worship psalm in the past. Let me set the stage for you. At the writing of Psalm 42, Absalom has in, uh, engineered a coup against his own father, David. Absalom is, Absalom is one of David's sons and, and uh, they have been reconciled. He brought Absalom back to the kingdom. There's been some stuff go on, but they've been reconciled. But instead of dwelling with his father and making things better, he, he sat at the gate and talked to all the people about how bad the king was. And if I was king, I would... Until finally he gathered enough people on his side that he engineered a coup against King David. He was ready to take over the kingdom and make himself king. And rather than fight against his son, he could have. David could have raised enough loyal followers. He could have fought and crushed Absalom and that would have been it. But rather than fight against his son, David has left Jerusalem. To put it in today, today's parlance, he has self-quarantined. We can identify with that, can't we? Instead of fighting that battle against his own son and in Jerusalem and in the house of God, He's self-quarantined and he's waiting on the Lord. Others have encouraged, David, you need to fight. Some of his generals, some of his advisors, David, you need to do something and, and fight. And, and they said, no, this is God's spoken to me and this is God's. So he's self-quarantined and he's waiting on the Lord and he's writing this song. Listen to what he says. As a deer pants for the water brook, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? We've sung that as a worship song, but David's crying out. He's essentially saying this. He's saying, when do I get to go back to church? <laughs> back to the tabernacle. Back to, back to the place where I worship. I, I'm self-quarantined and there's so much stuff going on and Absalom's there and I'm quarantined over here. When do I get to go back to church? Back to Jerusalem. Back to the tabernacle. A lot of folks are asking that today. When can I go back to church? Many are still afraid. And I, understand, I understand. Some have health problems and some. I understand that. I do. We do. And if all you can do is watch online, watch online. Do it. Then David says this in verses 3 and 4 of Psalm 42. My tears have been my food day and night. While they continually say to me. Keep that in mind. They. While they continually say to me. Where is your God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul within me, for I used to go with the multitude. I went up with them to the house of God with a voice of joy and praise with the multitude that kept the pilgrim feast. And, and we used to do, we used to have people coming in and greeting them at the door and different ones walking in uh, and greeting one another with hugs and handshakes and arm in arm. And we came in together rejoicing and singing So David's crying out and saying, they continually say to me, where is your God? And when am I going to get to go? So the first thing, I'm going to give you three things this morning. The first thing you need to do is stop listening to yourself. David is complaining and grumbling day and night and he's working himself up in, inside. Tears day and night. I pour out my soul within me. Basically, he says, I'm talking to myself. Crying and weeping and grumbling and complaining. And when you go down that path, the enemy jumps on you and makes it even worse. How many know that whatever you say, the enemy can build it up into a big scenario? Huh? Well, you don't want to go back to that house of God. Nobody there likes you anyway. Huh? 
And then he says, and you know what? Besides that, God's forgot all about you and he doesn't even know where you're at or what's going on in your life. Verse 3, my tears have been my food day and night while they continually say to me, where is your God? Well, who's this they he's talking about? He answers in verses 9 and 10. Why do I go mourning? Because of the oppression of the enemy. How many know we have an enemy and he's an oppressor? He's an accuser. He accuses us before God and he accuses us to our own self. You've sinned too much. That's why you're going through this. You've done this and God's forgot about you and none of it's true. You know how I know? Because the devil is a liar. So he says, why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As the breaking of my bones, my enemies reproach me. And listen, while they say to me all day long, where is your God? Who's that they? It's our enemy. He's called Satan, the devil. And he has some cohorts, some fallen angels with him. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5, 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks around, about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And our enemy has jumped on this. On this pandemic and all the other things. He's telling you that it's going to last forever. How many know that God can just... I'm not sure why he hasn't yet. I don't know. I'm not God. He has a plan and he has a purpose. There was a man that Jesus walked by that was blind. The disciples said, why is this man blind? Is it because he sinned or his mom and dad sinned? And Jesus said, no, but for the glory of God, he healed him. There was another beggar sitting at the gate of the beautiful, uh, the beautiful gate at the temple. He was healed in the book of Acts. Y'all remember that? I wonder how many times Jesus passed by him. Because he went into the temple. He was there. But he passed by that guy. Why? Because he was due to be healed in Acts chapter 3. I don't know. Understand. I know that God has a timetable. And God has a, a, a time for everything. And our enemy jumps on us saying this is going to last forever. And. You'll never have a peace and you'll never have a strength again and, and you'll never be able to go to, to church. And if you do, it'll never be like it used to be. And I say to that, I hope it's not like it used to be. I hope it's more powerful and more spirit outpouring and more healings and more miracles than we've ever seen before. Jesus said this in John eight forty four. Jesus said the devil does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own resources for he is a liar and the father of it. He lies and he's the father of all lies. So stop listening to yourself. And then start speaking God's word. Amen. Amen. Verse 5 in Psalm 42, he says, Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God. For I shall yet praise Him for the help of His countenance. David says, essentially, Soul, shut up. (laughs) How many sometimes we have to tell ourselves, Quit talking like that. Shut up. We're going to hope in God. Amen? We're going to put our hope and we're going to praise Him for His help right now. So stop listening to and repeating what the devil says. Start abiding in Jesus Christ and in the Word of God and repeating what the Word of God says in faith. Amen? We're not denying that we're going through something. It's affecting our whole country. And not only is our country going through something, all, it seems like so many of God's people are going through personal battles at the same time. We're fighting against things that we can't even hardly comprehend and, and it's got us down and, and, and we're depressed. And yes, I'm using that word, depressed. When you find Elijah sitting under a tree saying, Lord, just take me on home. I'm all alone. That's depression. When you find Moses saying, God, if you're just going to keep treating me like this, kill me now. 
That's depression. When Paul even says, we were at the point of death. So we're not denying that we're going through stuff and some of us going through more than others. But I need to remind you that we're going through it with God. Let's look, look back at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. Paul said, yes, above measure, above strength, we despaired even of life. And we had the sins of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Who delivered us from so great a death does deliver us. And in whom we trust he will still deliver us. He has delivered. He still does deliver. And he will deliver us. Hallelujah. He's done it in the past. He's still doing it right now. And he's going to do it. I believe it. <coughs> God is working. Even in this. Let me, tell you, let me tell you this. And I know it's difficult. This is different. This is not church like we know it. I need to tell you this. Our online audience has tripled. We got, uh, when I checked the mail this morning, our mail runs crazy down here at the church. And sometimes we get it on, on time and sometimes it comes way late. There's been times the mail didn't come till 6 o'clock. So I always come in uh, on Sunday morning and check to see if we got any mail from Saturday that came late. And we did. And we had uh, somebody send in a check. Never been here, never darkened our door, but they watch online. It's a lady I know her name, and she comments, and we I've got an on I've got an online congregation that runs in the thousands right now. Every day between twenty five hundred and three thousand people watch what we do. With the prayer and coffee, with the Bible study, with the Sunday morning service, we're reaching out. I know it's not like what we want to see. And we want to see bodies in these seats. And God promised us that. And He's still going to do that. Amen? But He's still at work right now. We're still sowing seed. Amen? The Holy Spirit's going to water that seed. And in due season, we will reap if we don't faint. The Word of God is still going out. Touching lives. I had another one private message me this just past week. Saying, uh, what kind of church are you and where are you at? So I told him. <laughs> so quit listening to yourself and the devil because he jumps in every time you start talking to yourself. Start speaking the word of God. And just as important, the last one is this. Start talking with God. Have a conversation. Don't just cry out, Lord, why? What's going on? You see, after Elijah poured out all his complaint and when he finally got still and there was, a, there was a wind and an earthquake and a fire. And then finally God said in a still small voice, I've still got some stuff for you to do, Elijah. I haven't forgotten you. I know where you're at. And he named three different people that Elijah was to anoint for assignments in the, God, in the kingdom of God. And one of them was his replacement, Elisha. And he was going to train him and show him everything. Start talking to God and make it a conversation. Talk and then listen. Psalm 42, verse 5, we read it a while ago. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Uh, hope in God, for I will yet praise Him for the help of His countenance. Notice that last phrase, for the help of His countenance. He repeats this same phrase on twice more. Once again in Psalm 42, in verse 11, and in the next Psalm, verse 5, but it's a little bit different. Here's what it says. Psalm 42, 11. Why are you cast down on my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I will yet praise Him. The help of my countenance and my God. The first time He just said, for the help of His countenance. Now He's saying, my countenance and my God. He said the same thing in Psalm 43, verse 5. The same exact, except the help of my countenance and my God. Here's what I know. When we start talking to God and look into His face, it changes our face and it changes us. Just being in His presence. Amen? 
When we look at God, instead of looking at the circumstances, we get encouraged. We get strengthened. We find His hand wrapped around our hand, pulling us up. Amen? When you draw near to God, James 4, 8, He will draw near to you. Who starts it? Who draws near first? When you draw near to God, He will draw near to you. Every time. Every time. Hebrews 4.12 Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher. Amen? He's going to finish this with you. The author and the finisher of our faith. In Philippians it says, He who began a good work in you will keep working and complete it in the day of Jesus Christ. He's going to keep working on you until Christ comes. 2 Corinthians 3.18 But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. When we spend time in God's presence, it shows up on our face. When we spend time just talking with God and in His presence and singing worship songs and pushing down, soul shut up for a while. I'm worshiping God right now. Huh? Devil, I'm not even, you're a liar. I'm worshiping God right now. I'm claiming God's promises. God's Word says... He is with me. He's never left me. Yes, I'm walking through the fire, but He's right here with me. Yes, I'm in the wind and the waves, but I'm walking with Jesus hand in hand. <coughs> Excuse me. Moses went into the tabernacle in the wilderness, went into the holy of holies, met with God there face to face. Offered sacrifices for all of Israel. Prayed for all of Israel. And when he came out, his face was so shining bright that he had to put a veil over his face so the people could even look at him. That world out there has no hope at all. They're going through all the same things we are with no hope, no Jesus, no spirit. They need to see that hope in us. They need to see us with peace and hope even in the middle of the storm. They need to see you coming out from your time with Jesus with your face shining with something of joy in your spirit. They need to see that you've got peace and hope in God. Yes, there's stuff going on and it's terrible and I don't like it. Some of it I actually hate. I hate it that Cindy's mom can't get out of her nursing home and all we could do on her 90th birthday was to make an appointment and just the two of us, the only ones that could be there and spend 30 minutes with her and we was trying to eat cake and they even shut us down from eating cake and said, put your mask back on. 90 is a big deal. We should have had a big blowout party for 90, invited all the relatives and here we are, just the three of us. I hate that stuff. I hate what it's doing to us. I hate what it's doing to our country. But I still have hope in God. And I've had a peace all the way through this that God is in charge and He's in control and He's got a timetable and He's going to do what He wants to do when He wants to do it exactly at the right time. Amen! So quit talking to yourself and listening to yourself and listening to the devil. Start claiming and speaking the Word of God. Speak it. Declare it. Sing worship songs that have the Word of God in it. And start talking to God. And listening to Him. Amen. We're going to pray. I'm going to pray a prayer for all those watching online. But there's some of us in here that need prayer this morning. And we're going to pray. You at home, I know that I spoke to some of you. And some of you are... You're holding on by a thread. Somebody said, when you're holding on by a thread, make sure it's the thread of the hem of His garment. Amen. Keep hold of Him. Don't let go. And I want to pray for you online today. Father, there are so many who are watching that are going through all of this that we're facing. 
but they're facing their own private circumstances as well. And we need your help. We need you re to remind us that you're nearby, that you're, you're as close as the whisper of your name, Jesus. And I pray that you would touch them. Lord, drive away the fear and bring peace and hope. You've not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And I pray that promise over everyone watching this morning. Every child of God that is about to lose their faith, lose their joy, maybe already lost their peace. God, I pray, restore this morning. Restore peace. Restore joy, Lord God. Let them laugh out loud despite what's going on. God, restore their faith. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you for watching. We're going to pray right here.